What's up, writers? Um, so, rhetoric gets a bad name. Let's be honest about it. Um, and rhetoric gets a bad name, right? We talk about kind of manipulative rhetoric, or it's just pre or it's just mere rhetoric, or it's political rhetoric. And oftentimes, when we use it, kind of in um, you know, rhetoric in a negative way, we mean that as kind of false speech or it's bullshitty or it's trying to kind of cover over some sort of truth. That rhetoric doesn't always have a kind of great relationship with the truth. Um, and I think that's true, right, in some ways. Actually, kind of one of the first um, definitions of rhetoric um, from Aristotle um, and is that it's about seeing, and I'm just gonna paraphrase this, it's about seeing the available means of persuasion So Aristotle says it's about seeing the available means of persuasion in a given situation. Notice here, it doesn't say anything about truth. It doesn't say anything about being factually accurate. Um, it doesn't say anything even really about being ethical or a good person. It really says about seeing what are the ways that you can persuade someone in a given situation. Um, and really kind of, you know, this going back to the early days of rhetoric, um, you know, um, the idea that rhetoric was kind of this neutral thing was a problem, right? That there was this kind of relationship where rhetoric didn't always lead to truth. Actually, rhetoric wasn't really so much concerned with truth, it was concerned with easing communication. And that was a problem uh, for a lot of people. Um, in the current moment, um, you know, rhetoric is not kind of just about persuasion. One of the definitions, um, you know, for me that I really like um, from, um, a researcher, Doug Downs, um, he says it's the operating system for human interaction. Um, and I really like that um, in the sense that it's really not just about persuasion. Um, in the current moment, we talk about rhetoric not just in terms of convincing someone, but kind of as a way of looking at all different discourse, whether that's persuasive or not. Um, but one of the other things, again, right, that we see both in the Aristotle and the Downs definition is that rhetoric is kind of neutral. Rhetoric can be used for good or bad. It's kind of like a superpower in that way. Now, the, you're probably thinking, you know, okay, well then I'll just not use rhetoric, right? If I want to be kind of a good person, an ethical person, to be direct with my audience, I'm just not going to use rhetoric. And what both Aristotle and Downs would say is like, good luck, right? Because if that is the operating system for human interaction, well, what other operating system are you going to use, right? So what people say is that it's not about whether or not to use rhetoric, it's about how you are using rhetoric. So one of the things that we know from this is that rhetoric can lie and manipulate. Um, and I'm not endorsing that, right? I'm definitely not endorsing you lying and manipulating, but I'm saying that actually what I've been teaching you in this entire course, you could use for those purposes. And that kind of sounds really bad, but let's actually see kind of why that is. And one of the reasons is because rhetoric is epistemic. All right, big fancy word, what does that mean? Basically, what epistemic means is that it creates new knowledge. Um, and really, kind of, this comes from the concept of epistemology. And epistemology kind of is a body of philosophy that asks, how do we know what we know? And how rhetoric answers this is to say, how do we know everything we know? Well we know it through discourse. So let me illustrate for you for a second. Let's say that we have um, an, so actually let me go back to the second, right, creates new knowledge, not necessarily truthful or factual knowledge. Big asterisks here. 
So let's take something like, um, let's start with an idea. Um, and let's actually let me make that a little bigger. here. So let's start with an idea. Um, and let's start with this idea that the Earth is round. Um, now, how do you know that? Well, you can say, oh, I've seen it, right? Everyone knows that the Earth is round, right? I see the sunset. Well, how do you know that that is not because that there is just a cliff at the edge of the earth. And you could say, well, okay, I know that because other people in the world think that, right? You know, people talk um, as if the round, um, as if the earth is round. Um, you know, we could say like, well, NASA, you know, has photos, right? I've seen actually kind of multiple photos. Um, multiple different scientists say that the earth is round. Right, you know, my experience kind of correlates with that. Um, and we could say, um, you know, that, um, you know, we can observe it. Even though if we've never kind of been, um, you know, in space to actually observe it, we can actually kind of combine these things to say, okay, if we assume a round Earth and we know that the Earth kind of moves this way because of what scientists say, then when we observe the sunset, we can assume that that, in, and that makes sense with a round Earth. You probably see where I'm going here. Now, one of the things is that this is a good truth, right? We believe in that because we can link it to other things that we know. There's actually a lot of discourse around that. It's supported by the discourse. Um, you know, whether or not the Earth is round, the only way that we know that is going to be through our actual discussions about it. So if we're thinking about what if we say that the Earth is not round? So, you know, there are people out there, right, who believe that the Earth is flat, right? We have a kind of flat Earth society. And one of the things about um, that kind of group of people is they're saying, well, actually, don't believe this. But one of the things is that, like, say that we kind of come across this and we can see, well, wait a minute, one, two, three, four, five, you know, six sources and my own experience. Why I'm not going to believe this one? This is kind of an outlier here. That's not a very good truth because the strength of a truth is how it is connected to other pieces of discourse. It's about verifying here. Um, and so we can see here that, all right, well, the flat earth kind of, you know, doesn't really make sense, right? We can't really verify it with other sources. Now, and here's exactly what has happened with the flat earth society. What if we actually start to create more discourse? And we see here, all right, so we're going to create some science. We're going to create some articles. People are going to share their experience. And what that leads to then is that this discourse grows. And so we actually might have two competing truths here because these people are agreeing that this is the truth and these people are agreeing that this is the truth. Um, and eventually what could potentially happen is that this discourse gets so overpower, um, so overpowers this discourse that this becomes what the truth is. And this really explains why different people in different discourse communities have different discourse available to them and may believe things differently. So we could really kind of do the same thing with thinking about vaccines, for instance, or climate change denial, or um, kind of a lot of different kind of health and nutrition things that as this discourse grows, it becomes easier for people to believe it because that discourse is kind of around them and it kind of confirms what their experience is. So obviously this sets up a kind of really um, difficult situation. The digital world, one of the things that is kind of so amazing about it and also really kind of challenging and dangerous about it is that false discourse, right, or discourse that doesn't align with other truth um, could actually grow really, really fast in a short amount of time and really kind of destabilize how we think about truth in any given situation. So what do we do? What are some of the methods that we have? So like I said, rhetoric is fundamentally neutral. 
Um, and because it's neutral, right, it can lie, right? It can get, spread misinformation or disinformation or bullshit us. At the same time, and this is what's really amazing and important about rhetoric, it could also uncover lies and uncover bullshit and uncover um, manipulation. And so how are the ways that we do that? How do we use rhetoric to actually see how people are trying to manipulate us with rhetoric? Well, the first um, way is we go back to our kind of our two different kind of reading strategies, right? A close reading strategy and a distant reading strategy. So let's try a kind of close reading strategy. And a close reading strategy means that we're going to look at a text. Imagine that we have an article that is explaining that the Earth is flat. And we want to test to see whether or not this is actually something that we should find legitimate or not. Um, so the first thing that we'd want to do in this situation is we want to actually analyze this text rhetorically. We want to think about the rhetorical situation. And when we're thinking about the rhetorical situation, obviously, we want to think about the audience. Um, we want to be thinking about the author. We want to be thinking about the purpose and the type of text and the context as well. And so we can actually kind of lay those out and we can see, well, you know, is this author, is this someone who we should be trusting? Is the audience, um, you know, are, who is the audience for this piece? Um, what is the purpose of this piece? What is the motivation, et cetera? Um, we could also start to look at um, what Aristotle called the pisteus. Um, and the pisteus are rhetorical strategies that we use for persuasions. And there's a bunch of different ones, but I'm just going to go through some of the ones um, that are important um, now. So we could um, talk about kairos. And what kairos really means is kind of is, is it appropriate for the situation? Um, so we want to really be thinking about here um, is about um, time. Um, does it respond to the exigence? of the situation? Um, is it timely? Is it relevant? Um, is it appropriate for the situation? And that's going to help us decide whether or not um, is something that we should listen to in context. Um, the next ones that we might think of are probably ones that you're familiar with. Um, ethos, pathos, and logos. Now, if we go back to kind of what Aristotle was talking about with the Pisteus, he was really talking about rhetoric kind of in giving speeches in public fora. Um, obviously, rhetoric has changed a lot, but we still kind of use these terms, and they actually are quite um, you know, helpful for us in the current moment that we live in, the contemporary era, but we need to think about them slightly differently. Um, that you know, originally, ethos was kind of about character. Um, and so this is really about kind of like showing like I am a good kind of trusted person. And I think that is still true, but we need to actually go a little bit beyond that when we're dealing um, with the contemporary world. I like to think about here is, is this person a credible person to be talking on the subject? Hopefully you find me credible talking about rhetoric. But if I were giving you medical advice, hopefully you would not find me credible, right? Even though I may have a good character, or maybe you don't think I do, but I think I do, um, have a good character, I'm not credible on that subject. And that leads to another thing, right? Does this person have the right expertise? Um, the other thing that we might want to think about is that there might be kind of multiple authors here. So does the group have, or the agency that is um, writing this, have expertise on the subject? Um, and the other thing is we want to be thinking about what their motivation is. Is their motivation, um, you know, why are they doing this research? Why are they communicating? Why are they creating discourse? What is their end goal with that? What do they essentially want to do? And I think this becomes really important when we're thinking about, you know, things like the ethos of, you know, a fossil fuel company talking about whether or not there should um, be reduction in carbon policy. Um, we're going to see that they're motivated and that that's going to really affect their ethos and how much they are believed, um, how much we believe them. Pathos really traditionally is kind of emotional appeal. But in the current moment, right, it's really about kind of preying on your conscious and unconscious behavior. Um, and so this is really kind of about how we think about information, right? Behavior um, and cognition. 
So one of the things that we know is that people's, our own reasoning is motivated. We're not as rational as we like to think, that we are much more likely to believe someone who is in the same discourse community as we are. Um, we're subject to echo, echo chambers, filter bubbles. We like information that, that confirms what we already believe. So if we believe that the earth is round, we're going to accept information that the earth is round more readily than we are that the, informa that the world, um, information that the world is flat. So um, there's also kind of, you know, tribalism. So where we are, um, the kind of the quirks of human psychology are also things that we want to put under the category of pathos, things that are kind of sometimes really kind of just beneath the surface, kind of appeal to our tribal um, belonging, um, appeal to what we already believe true about the world can be really ways that people can manipulate us into thinking certain things. Um, and finally, is, uh, we have logos here, and this is kind of always thought about as an appeal to reason. Notice here that I didn't say appeal to good reason. This reason can be faulty. Um, and um, the other thing that, um, you know, logos is also kind of an um, appeal to kind of facts and evidence. And just like that, facts and evidence, you know, you could have facts and evidence, but those could be wrong. Um, so, um, if I said, you know, there's a survey that showed that, you know, eight out of 10 scientists believe the earth is flat. That is an appeal to reason. That is facts and evidence, but that's wrong facts or evidence. Or if I said you wouldn't be a true scientist if you didn't believe the earth was flat. That's an appeal to reason, but that's actually called a logical fallacy, right? It's kind of a trick that we use for reason to try to get people to believe things by thinking that they're rational. So when we're kind of looking at any kind of given piece of information, we could kind of use this close reading strategy by really looking at, um, you know, how is manipulation happening in the moment? So there was a study um, done, um, I think it was in 2017, it was right after the time um, of the 2016 election where a lot of people um, in um, the Western world were really concerned with the circulation of misinformation or disinformation um, in, you know, just the, the kind of digital ecosystem. And, um, you know, one of the um, studies that came out of that was um, a study at Stanford um, by um, a group of people who um, were looking looking at um, historians um, and teaching history. Um, but anyway, that, that's, they did this study where what they did is they looked at student fact checkers, they looked at students and how they fact checked and how they verified information, and they looked at professional journalists and professional fact checkers and how they did it. And they found that the students actually had some good strategies. But one of the things that the students did is that they really only focused on one text. Um, and so they would focus on the test and they would kind of look at this and they would make a decision based on the text whether or not that one text should be believable or not. Um, what the professional researchers did and the fact checkers were a little bit different. And what um, the researchers found in this study was that they used distant strategies or distant reading strategies. And what this allowed them to do is to kind of see how the truth um, exists in a network with other things and allow them to verify whether something was true or not. So let's just say they came across a piece of text that said, you know, the earth um, is flat. And what they found is that you know, students would just kind of look at this one text and they wouldn't think about all the other texts that are associated with it. But what professional researchers did is that they did a couple of different things. Um, they did, what they did is, well, they looked at other texts. And they would look at other texts and you know, they would find that, you know, well, one says the earth is flat but actually, when we start to look at a bunch of different other scientific texts, um, what we found is that they say the Earth is round. 
And then they combine that, right? They can say, okay, well, this was just kind of on some random Reddit forum, and really kind of this was on the NASA website. This is, you know, on um, a scientific journal, right? Here is a high quality gray source. Here is a background source. Here is another scholarly source. And they can see, well, okay, well, this is kind of, these are the outliers here. Um, there's very little support. Remember, a truth is only as good as what is the discursive support for that. So this strategy, what they did is, um, they looked at these kind of next to each other, and they called this strategy lateral reading. And lateral reading is kind of comparing other documents um, against th the first document that you're looking at or the first piece of information to see if that can be supported. The other thing that they did, um, professional fact checkers, is that they would see information in the text, and they would see where did that information come from. So let's say that, all right, um, this idea that the Earth is flat, where did that idea come from? And then they would you know, find that idea either kind of in a link or a citation. Um, and they would see that, oh, it actually came in um, you know, this text. And this text says you know, the Earth is flat. And turns out this text um, says the Earth is flat, and this text says the Earth is flat. And they would see, oh, OK, this is where they're getting their ideas. What they termed this was going upstream. So where did these ideas um, come from? And when you actually start to go upstream, you can see, OK, this is a post that maybe I see on a social media piece. And this links me back to um, a Reddit forum with 200 users. And that um, Reddit forum with 200 users actually links me back. Their just their evidence for this claim is a website. Um, and this website you know, um, cites a scientist, but I can't find anything about this scientist or this scientific paper. I can't even find it. And so that's going to tell me that these sources, which have low ethos, um, you know, low quality, that that is what this source is relying on for their ethos. Because one of the things um, that is going on here is we're seeing that what is the prior information that this is built off of. And if that is not good quality information, um, then that means that this piece of information is not going to be helpful. So these were kind of the two different moves that um, these um, the professionals made that the students really didn't do. Right, The students were kind of really focused on this one source. They weren't necessarily seeing the source in a network. So that's one of the things that you want to start to be doing when you're starting to verify information to see where did these ideas come from? Can we trust these sources? If you can't trust these sources, you can't really trust these sources. Um, how does it fit into context, right? Is there going to be agreement by other sources whether or not? Now, sometimes, you know, obviously this is kind of an easy example. It's kind of very cut and dry. The Earth is flat or it's not flat. It can get obviously a lot more complicated with this with most issues in the world. The other thing, the other benefit of that is this is also a really amazing research strategy. If we are kind of verifying information, we can see, well, how does this piece compared to these other pieces. In finding those pieces and comparing them to each other, we're doing synthesis, we're understanding a discourse community. Um, by going upstream and following source trails to other things, we're gathering more information. So it actually helps to start with kind of one document and move out by going upstream or lateral with these networks, both for verifying information and for actually doing more research to actually lead to synthesis, um, even if that information isn't as problematic or as difficult as the Earth is flat or the Earth is not not flat. Um, so really kind of what you're looking at here is kind of what is the stability of truth? Is there support for that kind of in um, you know, the, the discursive context um, that you're in? And if there's not support for that, well, then we really you know, should be really skeptical of that information. So these are kind of two different strategies. Um, I think one of the, the difficulties as we're finding out in the digital age, and this is really kind of something that we're getting at over the next couple of weeks in the course, and I want to really hear your thoughts on that, is that you know, imagine kind of, um, you know, this flat Earth idea is that right now we have kind of a lot of texts that are saying the Earth is round. 
But one of the things about the digital ecosystem is that it can easily um, you know, add more discourse very fast, where essentially it could kind of flood the system. So what we're getting is we're seeing kind of flat things over and over and over. And this is really kind of, you know, how social media and powerful forces can and platforms can start to kind of influence actually what we think of as the truth. Is that suddenly if we go um, in a digital space and we see that there's a lot of discourse that the earth is flat, um, one of two things are gonna happen, right? We're going to, you know, either believe that the earth is flat or we're gonna start to call into question our initial idea that the earth is round. And so this becomes less powerful. And then I think the overall effect, and this is I think what people are really kind of worried about with disinformation and misinformation, is that it changes the shape of the entire ecosystem. And it makes it really difficult to verify for ourselves. And it also kind of creates this widespread skepticism where people don't believe anything. Right, because we can't be concerned because how do we know there's so much information up here and a lot of it is false, how do we know who to believe? And what that does is creates this kind of massive destabilization of the truth and that really can like really mess with our ideas of reality. And then I think really, you know, I'm not really sure kind of what to do about that. I have no kind of answers. This is a moment that we're in. So I'd love to hear your thoughts in it in our um, discussion for uh, this week. Um, I will say, though, that this shows us how powerful discourse is. Remember, discourse is language and action, and how powerful manipulating discourse can really work to change people's minds, and that's really the reality that we all share. Um, so here are just some tips on kind of how to keep yourself afloat within that. Um, but I wanna hear your comments more about kind of what are your strategies for kind of dealing with this um, you know, um, ecosystem in which um, you know, our epistemology is continually shaken um, on a daily basis. See you next time, writers.